and look into the neurological path as we know it, uh, take into process and store knowledge and why this is a good way for that. Number three, I'm going to consider the most effective target words that I would suggest you use when you're teaching. Four, share the most effective pedagogical approaches for teaching, the best way to deliver that in the classroom. And number five, offer an overview of what we're doing at my school at the moment in year seven and how we hope to roll that out to other year groups. Do stop me at any point if you have any questions or it's not quite clear. So firstly, why is direct teaching, vocabulary teaching, essential? <coughs> I'm going to ask you to just engage with me in this kind of cognitive exercise here. How much energy does it take to, and then you've got five questions here, so flex your little finger, thrust the heavy door shut, embrace the teddy bear, beckon to someone for five hours, and seize a feather floating <laughs> through the air. Can you just spend a minute maybe discussing it with the person next to you, from least to most energy requires? <laughs> Scrawny little lad, still adorned in his pyjamas from the night before, was beckoned over by the flexed or threatative finger of a fierce-looking soldier. The boy was at odds about what to do and instinctively embraced his mother in distress. You can see here that some of these words have contextual clues for us to work out what they mean. There are some in this text where we aren't. So take the word beckoned, was beckoned over, it says, let me fall over, he fell over, he was um, pushed over, anything like that. It's harder for us to work out what this word means from the clues. And there was a study, oh, I'll just use these. But E.D. Hirsch says, those who know 90% of the words in a text will understand its meaning. Because they, and because they understand, they will also begin to learn the other 10%. But it's our duty as teachers to be teaching them, making sure that they know that 90% in order for them to make those educated guesses. 
And the second one by a study by Al Fassi in 2004 said the more extensive a reader's vocabulary and background knowledge, the easier it is to gain new information off the prior text. So if we don't have that previously acquired knowledge, we haven't got enough stuff to latch it onto when we're taking in new information. So we're trying to create a bed, a foundation of vocabulary knowledge for students to build their new knowledge on. And there was a study here, Isabella Beck is uh, quite very, very knowledgeable in this area of vocabulary. And she's written a book and there's a load and load of studies. And by Beck, McEwen and McCaslin in 1983, I acknowledge this was a long time ago, they speculated that there's this continuum. So that this is, I'm talking about here when you're reading independently, you're not being taught. If you have a student who's sitting there reading a book, they speculated that there are four types of context they come into, they encounter when they're reading this text. I will make my PowerPoint available online and blog about it afterwards, so just be aware of that. Um, so, the first, so there is misdirective, non-directive, general and directive. And I'll give you an example of each of these now so that you can see. In a misdirective context, look at this. Gregory had done all he could to complete the task. When Horace approached his cousin, he could see that Gregory was <coughs> exhausted. Smiling broadly, Horace said, you know there are dire results for your attempt. Okay, so we're misdirected here. Dire, we know, means terrible, awful, any of those. Smiling broadly directs us to the wrong result. It's giving us a misdirective context here. Okay, and that happens commonly in, when you're reading. And I've just summarised that there. Uh, and an example of that in a children's book, in Charlotte's Web, Wilbur the pig says to Charlotte the spider, I didn't know you could lay eggs. And she says, oh yes, I'm versatile. And he said, does versatile mean full of eggs? <laughs> and she says, certainly not. Versatile means I can turn with ease from one thing to another. So there's a, a misdirective context there. The second one is a non-directive. Dan heard the door open and wondered who had arrived. He couldn't make out the voices. Then he recognised the lumbering footsteps on the stairs and knew it was Aunt Grace. Here we've got no real scaffold to know what the word lumbering means. We can have a guess, but we've got no real scaffold. A third one is a general one where we can start to make a guess. Jo and Stan arrived at the party by, uh, at 7 o'clock. By 9.30, the evening seemed to drag for Stan. But Jo really seemed to be having a good time at the party. I wish I could be as gregarious as he is, thought Stan. But here we can make a guess that gregarious might mean someone who enjoys parties, someone who likes staying out, someone who's good with people. So it helps us towards an idea but doesn't quite confirm it. And then the final one is directive. So when the cat pounced on the dog, he leapt up yelping and knocked down the shelf of books. The animals ran past Wendy, tripping her. She cried out and fell to the floor. As the noise and confusion mounted, Mother hollered upstairs, what's all that commotion? So you can see already we've been given all of these clues to know what commotion means. So that's, that's the fourth version of the context that Beck came up with. And as you'll see, when they came to do their studies of this, and they tested adults because they wanted the adults to know a good number, a good decent number of words. And 11 out of 13 unfamiliar words were correctly defined in the directive context. So 11 out of 13 you can guess from a directive context. It got more and more difficult until the misdirective, when only 1 out of 13 were correctly defined. What I should just show in here from a research point of view is that this sample size, there were only two basal programs and only 13 adults were tested. However, what I would show in is this makes sense, doesn't it? If you've got more clues to work out a word meaning, then you're more likely to understand it, whereas if you haven't got many clues, then you're going to struggle. And so they say relying on le learning word meaning from independent reading is not an adequate way to deal with students' vocabulary development, not least because a number of our students don't enjoy reading and wouldn't choose to pick up a book for themselves. Uh, I would just throw in here, before I move on, that some research here by Starlin Fairbanks back in 1986 but has been uh, supported throughout the years is that when we're teaching words, if you just teach direct vocabulary instruction as a standalone word with no link to the subject knowledge, then it's likely to have an effect size of 0.32, which is just below. So if, if this is someone who's had no vocabulary instruction and they score 50% on a test, 
if you're then taught direct vocabulary but those words aren't linked to subject, then you get 62%. This is in the study. And then those who were taught direct vocabulary but linked to the subject knowledge, that was 83%. So you can see the effect size is 0.97, which is much, much higher. the neurological processing. Okay, so again, we can only do this from what we know from the research that we've got. This is humans trying to study the brain, which is always quite a tricky thing. But I can tell you what we know from our reading. So background knowledge, according to Anderson in 1995, background knowledge is stored in biomodal packets. We have packets of information. And I like this theory because I, it makes sense to me and it makes sense to the experience that I've had of teaching students. And he says there are two types of biomodal packets. There's linguistic, i.e. those that are all related to language and words, thinking about words and literature and all of that. And the second one is non-linguistic. So our experience is based on our emotions and our senses, how we feel, we think, we smell, um, and all of that. So if you took the example of a camping trip, he says that initially... Our knowledge is stored in linguistics. So we come home from a camping trip, we say to my mum, yeah, it was great, I did this, I did this, I did this. It's, it's all about what you did, it's your language of how you deliver that. After that, it then becomes non-linguistic. Well, how did you feel? What did you enjoy about it? What did you see? Tell me all of this stuff. So that's the secondary aspect of it. And over time, a person's information about one event will be generalised into a group of events. So if, for example, on my very first camping trip, I said, oh, I did this, and I had a marshmallow over the bonfire, we sang some songs, someone got their guitar out, some kumbaya, <laughs> and then uh, a ghost came out of the forest, making this up. But that's your first experience, and it's all about me, my experience of this. After that, if you then go on another camping trip the following year, and you see different things, but then you also notice some similarities to last year, you know that that's semantic, that's a, a generalised content. Oh, right, so this is what camping is. Ah, right, so it wasn't just that one experience. This is generally what people do when they go camping. There are some common traits to these general experiences. So he talks about it moving from episodic to one episode to semantic. Ah, so I'm starting to understand what camping is like or what going into London on the tube is like. All of those different things. And the dual coding theory does support this by Sadowski and Pivot in 1994. And they say there are these two separate representations. There's linguistic and then there is non-linguistic. And the way that they give this as an example in their book is they start off with I, I trekked. Oh, and their, their example is not camping, their example is trekking in Iceland. But I trekked, I was overwhelmed. I ate a smorgasbord, I bathed in a hot spring. And so on and so on and so on. So it's all my own experiences. Whereas the second one is, ah, so trekking in Iceland. Right, so there are glaciers. I need equipment such as these. There is the Northern Lights. Do you see what I'm saying here? Okay. So, and for that, I will come on to why this is important to my speech in a minute. Um, but for that, he says we can build up these biomodal packets. And we can start linking new vocabulary to these biomodal packets. So if I heard the new word... Uh, let me just think underground and I was going into London then I, and I'd never heard it before then I could link it onto my biomedical packet oh right, so I know that's linked to that I might also start linking it to my animals biomedical packet because underground, some animals live underground I might start linking it to infrastructure because I know that subways and uh, lots of things happen underground <laughs> not being very good here but you can see my point uh, and so then we think about how does that relate to our memory. And Graham Nuttall, who's a great educational researcher in New Zealand, he's done a lot of work there, he's looked into memory and how it's best to retain information. And he says that it starts off in your environment, makes sense, your teacher teaches you, you learn it through different things, moves to your working memory, you start processing it in a way that starts connecting to things in your long-term memory, back to these biomodal packets of things. And from here, you either continue to remember it and learn it and re revisit it, or you forget it. And that is an important part of learning, the forgetting, because we can't possibly, as humans, 
keep up every single bit of knowledge in our mind. There are times where we need to draw back on previously acquired knowledge and times where we can let it go. And he says there are three conditions of effective processing, and this is where this starts leading into how we've designed our curriculum at Green Shop. So the first one is strength. So we need it in our new programme of vocabulary, we needed to create at least three exposures to new information, and that's repeated practice. The second one is depth, so that's not just spoon feeding students and saying, here's the word, this is what it means, go away and learn it, because that's, that's giving them the answer. They need to think very hard about what this word means to them, connecting it to their own experiences, which are different to the person next to them, and trying to get some understanding of that word. Uh, and Robert Bjork, who's another researcher in the US, talked about desirable difficulties and actually making learning hard is a good thing because you take ownership of it as a learner. And thirdly, elaboration, the way that you connect it to other stuff that you already know and making associations, and I'll show you how we've done that. And Graham Nuttall said, as learning occurs, so does forgetting, which is what I was saying, it's important that we know when to learn and when to forget the things that we do. And this learning curve just gives an example. So if, for example, on Monday, I teach a new word here, and then it is never remembered, it will be forgotten by day three. If, however, I teach it on Monday, and then I start to forget it, and then on Tuesday I go back to it, then it takes longer for me to forget it. And then if I return to it again, and it's harder to forget it, does that make sense? So it's about this gradual process of revisiting information called the forgetting curve by Robert And I will move on, and if anyone has any questions, to this third part, what the most effective target words. There's quite a lot of debate about which words we should target in the language. Um, but from the synthesis of various studies, we can come to some kind of common understanding. So, Rolfus and Ackerman in 1999 said these are the five that they would recommend you study uh, teaching as a teacher. Subject specific words and phrases that embody deep underlying concepts. So, subject specific words, to make it simple. Two, roots and suffixes. So, root, prefix, suffixes. Three, proper nouns that relate to your subject. So, people, places, events that are important in your subject. Four compound words, and five subject and verb phrases. And Daniel Willingham says, students come to understand new ideas by relating them to old ideas. If their knowledge is shallow, the process stops there. And that's really, really key to note. If you've heard of the Matthew effect, I'll come on to that, but it's about having this knowledge and developing it rather than uh, trying to find it and you're not deep-rooted in anything. So back to Beck, who's done a lot of research on this, from her book, Robust Vocabulary Instruction. They've got this tiered word, and I know there'll be some literacy specialists in here and speech and language specialists who, who know of this hierarchy. Do most people know this hierarchy? No? Yeah. Okay, so a lot of you do, some of you don't. So high-frequency words. These are words that we wouldn't necessarily teach because in conversation they come up really, really regularly. They're words that <coughs> our students kind of have this developmental process as a child, they don't really need to be, well they are taught it, but they don't need to be taught it at school. The second one, tier two, high frequency words in written text, not so common in conversation. So words like gregarious, like we talked about earlier, beneficial, required, maintained. And these aren't subject specific. Tier three would be more subject specific and they'd be considered more academic language. Okay? Now, Beck suggests with her team that tier two is where we should target. Tier two is where we should target because they are the ones that help us access tier three. I would say yes, and we have taken some of these for our program. However, tier three is crucially important because that is your subject knowledge that you will be able to link back to what they know. And the National Reading Panel Synthesis of Vocabulary Research in 2010, i.e. they had 324 studies uh, that they'd managed to find online and in computers and on their system, had 324 studies that were related to things like literacy, language, or development, vocabulary, 
And from that, they whittled it down because they had to. Ha they said it must be relevant. They had these 324 studies, but they said, well, no, we need to make it smaller than that. So it must be relevant. Must be published in a science journal. Must involve a, con a control group and a treatment group in a research trial. Must be between 2001 and 2009. And from that 324, went down to 14 studies. And from those 14 studies, all of a similar likeness, they came up with eight principles that they said seem to be working very well for vocabulary teaching. And they are, number one, you should provide direct instruction of vocabulary words for a specific text. So if you're looking at a text on trigonometry, or you're looking, no, you probably wouldn't be, you'd be doing all the credit. Looking at a subject, uh, a text on poetry or on uh, something with being very rubbish in science, then it needs to be specific to that text. Number two, repetition and multiple exposures is key. Number three, words should be you taught that learners will find useful in many contexts. So teaching them for an hour on one word that they're only likely to find every two years is not really worth the time. Is it? <coughs> and number four, the task should be restructured. So do you remember <coughs> this morning Leyland was talking about <coughs> trying to change up the task. If there's a student not getting it, find another way in. Try and help them to connect it to the knowledge that they've got. Number five, it should be active engagement that goes just beyond definition. So try and start connecting it just beyond that definition. Computer technology is useful. Vocabulary can be acquired through incidental learning, so learning as you're reading a book. And dependence on a single vocabulary instruction method will not result in optimal learning, so try and mix it up a bit. Your pedagogy should be slightly different, whether that's teaching it in class, whether it's playing a game around the word, might be doing a quiz online about the word, and I'll show you that a bit later. And he says here, that, oh, and yeah, this was the summary of the research. In summary, active vocabulary instruction should permeate a classroom and contain rich and interesting information. Vocabulary instruction should cover many words that have been skillfully and carefully chosen to reduce vocabulary gaps and improve students' abilities to apply word knowledge to task comprehension. So again, all of this is ultimately leading to do they know what they're doing? Do they understand this text? So that leads us on to what are the most pedagog effective pedagogical approaches, which unfortunately they came back at us, the, that synthesis just said, there isn't actually one specific way. But I'll tell you what we're heading towards. You can see here how closely linked academic background knowledge is to academic achievement. So if this is your background knowledge at level one, then this is your general achievement. Background knowledge to achievement, background knowledge to achievement. So you see that your background knowledge is key in your achievement, in developing uh, or in making progress, making good progress. Uh, talking about that Matthew effect, where we've got this huge gap between students who are word poor, students who are word rich. Templin in 1957 said, estimated difference of vocabulary knowledge 4,700 words between students of high and low socioeconomic status. And that might be as a result of not reading at home, that might be as a result of not enough language at home. In fact, I went to visit and met a head teacher of our local primary school, and she was saying that in their catchment area, because of the nature of the jobs that the um, parents have and lots of different social factors, they're actually hoping to get the students in a year early, earlier than three, or, or getting them in around two to three, to just spend the year to work on their language because they come in way below the national average. And if that's the case, then you're always going to be, you've got no chance for plateau, have you, in the education system. So they're trying to develop that background knowledge through, whether that's through direct experiences or indirect experiences, and I'll talk about that now. So if you're a student who's got a financial capacity or parents' time or parents' interest to come with you to go to all of these places like museums and galleries, theatre universities, travel and holiday or worship places, all of that, then you're going to have great background knowledge of different experiences. 
If you're not, then you're going to struggle a lot more because you can't relate your new information to other stuff. So as a responsibility of us, we need to be thinking about creating indirect experiences for our students, and that might be through these mediums, through books, magazines, newspapers, documentaries, uh, films, music, pictures, radio, any of that, so that we can help develop their uh, background knowledge. And so from that, we've created six steps to effective vocabulary instruction taken from a book, which I highly recommend, by Robert Marzano, called Building Academic Vocabulary. And he talks about six steps here, and we've really tried to apply these where we are. So I'll just go through them now. So number one... Oh, so am I too quick? Yeah. <laughs> I have about three people going, oh. <laughs> Okay, so number one, you would introduce the term. When you're introducing a new word, try not to give the formal definition. So don't go, well, do go to the, the dictionary and get the definition. But don't deliver it as such as you go. So I take the word demographic. I would not, personally, from my research, I would not stand there and give the formal definition from the Collins English Dictionary and say, well, it's a section of the population sharing common characteristics, such as age, sex, gender, class. Because there will be for some students, and that's not particularly an in-depth example there, but there'll be some students who find that as an obstacle because they won't understand some of those words from the definition. So if you can make the language a bit more colloquial, a bit more chatty to them, and they might retain it a bit better. So even just the delivery, I haven't mixed it up too much, but I might just go, well, it's a group of people in a, in a certain area, they might share the same kind of trait, they might be the same age, the same gender. See what I'm doing? Just trying to make it a bit more informal. And within that first step, I would also really highly recommend morphemes, and I'm sure that many of you do this anyway. Morphemes are chunks of words that mean different things. So demo means people. Graphic means write or record. And if you think I'm a fan of knowledge, I'm not. I Google etymology. So the word etymology will take you to the roots of these word parts. So demo means people. Graphic means write or record. All oh, right, so that means I'm recording the people in a certain area. Right, so I can start to understand that. And if I take demo, and I know that that's people, bear in mind that some morphemes have more than one meaning. So if you think about a demonstration, that doesn't always mean the same thing. But demo means people in most situations. Strength or power is cressy. So then that means, right, the democracy is people who have the strength or the power. And then I say, right, aristocracy, that's the best strength or power. And then I can take graphic and think autobiography. So many students get the confusion between biography and autobiography. If you know that auto means self, that means it's your own, it's about you. Okay, bio is life. If you took biology, that means life. Theology is the study of, so then the study of theology is theo means gods, and then monotheism, the means God again, ism can be a belief um, or hatred towards a particular group, and mono means one. So you can see there that morphemes have unlimited, unlimited value, and, and as a literacy leader I would really love to be going around my school seeing teachers from all over the curriculum being delivering that. And I have seen it. We have that. Think how relevant that might be in science or geography or <coughs> history. Step two, the students <coughs> could say it back to me. So I know that they've got what I've said. It's, it's slightly different to me asking them a question about it. So I might get a few, I'll choose a few students randomly around the room and say, can you tell me what that means? What does it mean? I've just told you, now you tell me. Or I get them to say it to a partner. At this point, you really want to iron out any, mis any misunderstandings here. If they start learning the wrong meaning at this point, then you're on a kind of downward spiral. So make sure that your class know what this means at this point. And then the option to write it down as well. Step three, they then should restate non-linguistically uh, to look at that dual coding memory. So that's why I was talking about the linguistic and non-linguistic. And that might be through images, they might draw a picture, they might have a word map, they might draw pictograms, connections to words they've already got, graphic organisers. And I'll show you the way that we're doing that now. 
So we've got this vocabulary journal that I've created, and on it they've just got the name and all of that. And inside, there's a, a starter page where I've done an example of a chart that they've got into, what's the word, alternatively in their book. Um, and I'll show you that in a minute. And then here they've got some bubble mats, that, thinking mats, that they can use to break down words. So up here, you can't see it. It's like that. So they put the new word in the top. They would have their description on their own definition there. They'd tell me what part of speech it is. Synonyms and antonyms, there's not always one for that. So demographic wouldn't really have an antonym or a, yeah, an antonym for demographic, but sometimes they work. Links to subjects or settings that they've got how they would use it in a sentence, and then half a page here to draw something so that they're getting that linguistic, non-linguistic link. And then I'll just show you four examples of the graphic organiser that we recommend. I know that there you've got a lot more options. <coughs> I personally would stick to a set number. We've chosen four to use because you don't want students to get bogged down by the, the type of map. You want them to use it as a tool, not as how to draw it. So the first one is simple, a lot of these will be familiar to you, circle map, you put your new word in the middle, so take the word register, there's lots of meanings to the word register, so in the second bubble you would fill in the definitions that you know, so it might be, um, well it's linked to timbre in music, it's recorded by someone's facial expression when you say oh they registered on their face, might be a language term for a particular genre, uh, a list to record people's names, lots of those things, and then around it you would put how, what is influencing your understanding of that word, so all the different ways that you know what register means. The second one, you must have seen this, a bubble map, put the new word in the middle and anything around it to describe. The other one is comparing and contrasting, so if we've got synonym and antonym here, the first word I would put here, so sin and sim mean same, and then I've got an example, so big and larger synonyms. And then I've got, it's two words that have the same meaning. On this side, characteristics of word two. two there's, there's, um, must be some tone of thing missing. Uh, and then I've got ant, which means opposite. Big to small, cold to hot. And then two words that have opposite meanings. And in the middle, I've got anything that joins them together. So nim means name, taking those morphemes. Okay, and then it relates to pairs of words, used to compare and contrast. And they're both semantics, so they're both about meanings as well. A third one, this is great for those morphemes, so take demographic, take autobiography, photosynthesis. You put the whole word over there, parts here, and then the meanings of those parts here. Just deconstructing language. And the idea of this being that students begin to take ownership of their language, not just being daunted by a new word and having to learn every new definition. If they can learn parts of words, then they've got the toolkit to learn these new words themselves. Number four, plan for multiple exposures. So uh, ways that we do that are linguistic and non-linguistic, similarities and differences, we classify words, uh, we use metaphors and analogies. Now this is one sticking point. I've had some feedback from staff. We met together and I said, give me the honest truth, how this go? So this is a pilot for us, it's working really well, but one of the downsides is we're teachers and we've got a whole curriculum to fit in. When do you expect us to teach all of this on, on top of our subject knowledge? And so one way that we've reviewed this is we were originally, uh, they were originally committing to do it maybe five minutes at the start of each lesson or, or half an hour of one day and then ten minutes of the next kind of thing, but they've realised that's quite ambitious for us, so can we find an alternative? And one of the ways that we'll show you before the end is that we've moved some of these activities online. And we have, do we have online learning classrooms? We have um, a, a way that we can create, generate quizzes, matching tasks, and I'll talk you through that video when it comes on. Sorry. Go on. I've just been to see the knowledge maps, and America's been using advanced organisers for a long time, mm. and they're not going to include vocabulary in this way, in those ways of um, organising the thoughts in those knowledge maps. Mm. So this seems to be something that they really can share. It's linked into the subject matter. Yeah. Oh, right. Okay, that's really helpful to know. Thank you. 
And so some examples of that, so metaphors, connecting words to other words. So the very famous one, Shakespeare does you like it. All the world's a stage, <coughs> and all the men and women are merely players. And then analogies are very good, because again, you're drawing on your knowledge. So oxygen is to humans, as carbon dioxide is to plants. And then you could turn this into a close activity for students to complete. So mason is to stone, as carpenter is to wood. <laughs> okay. I'm not going to patronise you. <laughs> Step five, students should discuss the new term with each other because a student with word poor language might really benefit from someone with word rich and that's where your seeking plans can really play a really big part in generating some of this for students, helping them with these indirect experiences. <coughs> So, uh, to give you an example of this, I've got the word chronic, so I'll just verbalise, I'll give you a metacognitive example here. So in chronic, right, previous exposures, well my dad always says he gets chronic back pain, so that must mean really bad, because I know it really aches when he gets it. Context, well he's describing his back pain, so that's, a part of speech is probably an adjective. The purpose of it, well he's trying to help me understand how he feels. Morphemes chron, chron means Time, it is relating to, so it's got to be relating to time, so it can't mean it's really bad. Syllables, chronic, there's two. Spelling, well I've got a k there, which looks like a ch, but I know that it's a k, like in Christmas and choir. And then connective words, chronic, well, I know that chronology is the study of an order of time, chronological order. And then I might work out that, oh right, so his back pain doesn't mean it's really bad, it means it's, it's been going on for a long time, and actually if you look in the dictionary, chronic does mean has been lasting a long time. And then the way that you could do that, if you don't want students to share back straight away, is just do a think, think on your own, care, share it, and then feed it back to the class, so it's not too daunting. And finally, and this is, you know, in some ways idealistic, because of time limits, uh, you would then get them to play around with the words and do charades and do picturing. This one we can do online and word association, um, but not always. So finally, as I move on to this fifth objective, what is our trial approach to si delivering systematic vocabulary across year seven? So we have made use of all the research that we've done, and we've got two separate strands. The the best, best practice is three, the third one being silent independent reading plan. However, we know that we haven't got the structure in place yet for that to be fully effective in our school. We don't want it to be a wasted tutor time of students sitting there with a book but not really reading it. So we want to make sure that we're ready for that when we introduce that. So at the moment we've got two strands going. The first one in tutor time, that's one lot of 15 minutes a week. And the way that we're trialling it, we're only doing it in three tutor groups at the moment because we've got a control group and we've got an active group, uh, a treatment group. And so they focus on roughly 24 groups per half term because they do three or four in a session. In English lessons, they do have seven lessons per cycle, but we don't, we don't refer to this every lesson. And then it's still the same group of students, but they're split into four classes because there's four English teachers. And they focus on 10 words per cycle per new text. And the assessment that we've got... Uh, is yeah, it's simply new group reading test and their English baseline and then we'll assess it at the end. And throughout there we've got the formative assessments going through quizzes and things like that. So as an example of this first half term that we had, we looked at Lamb to the Slaughter in Year 7 by Rob Dahl. And we had 10 vocabulary items linked to English, the first four of which are Tier 2, the last six of which are Tier 3. And then we used these in our first cycle, Miss, Hydro and Ian. Teachers are given this cycle map so they know what the words are. We don't expect teachers in this trial to be doing this themselves because they have a lot going on. So in this trial we've provided this for them with the ideal being that as it cascades and as it develops more, teachers would take on a bit of the planning of this. So they have the words there. They have, um, these are definitions tasks. So that's the modelling of teachers to model it. Definitions task and in connections. We've separated those because we know how important it is to make connections as well as just give definitions. Oh, your colours are really bad on there, but I don't know if you can see it up here. 
uh, in pink are all the ones that English do. So, for example, and this isn't always right, but this is an example demo. In English, on a Monday, uh, week one, they would introduce the new ten words. On a Wednesday, they wouldn't teach it in class, but they might use it as homework or go online to do the quizzes that we've created. On a Thursday, they'd have their tutor time session. On a Friday, they wouldn't necessarily teach anything, but they would still be exposed to those words again, so that we've got those multiple exposures in the text. And then week two, we have nothing on a Monday. Tuesday, they might talk about it or do a journal activity in English. Then they might do the homework again online on Wednesday tutor time, and then might just be exposed to it in the lesson there. So I'm just showing you, roughly in terms of commitment, it would be one to two lessons of English per week with homework as well. I'm just going to show you this as an example of uh, an online task that I've done. It's my voice, it's very quiet because I've only got these small speakers in here, but if I need to then I can go over it. Can you hear that? No. <laughs> Also very monotone, so I'll just do it myself. Um, so as I go through, I'll just show you the types of questions that I've created. It is going. Yeah. Okay, so here, oh, you're not going to be able to see. Maybe I'll just leave this. It says, put the events in story order, chronological order. And what I've done is included here words that we were focusing on. So I've got Mary Maloney loved to luxuriate in the presence of her husband. So luxuriate is one of our words. I've also got premises, because that's a tier two word, and then congeal here. So it's not only about trying to sort the content. This is probably the, the question with the most content knowledge of the story. The rest are more vocabulary related. That one you have to know the order. This one, you've got to drag the boxes into the correct spaces. So the story something was a ghost town. So here we're using metaphors. Best practice given five options, because it's more of a challenge. And we're using words here that could link or words that are target words. Number three, again, the something is a roller coaster of emotions. So is it plot, setting, tranquil, premises, or literary? So I carry this one. This one, uh, match these analogies. So tranquil is to war, so they'd have to think, well, that's quite opposite as. Placid is to stressed, because placid is another one. Horror is to genre, well that is a genre, as beach is to setting. And then crunchy is to apple, as jelly is to, or as congeal is to jelly. So again, we're using all of these words. Different tasks, multiple choice, using that linguistic, non-linguistic task. Then they would have to sort these categories, so we've got congealed and tranquil, two quite different words for us, but if they're new to them, they have to sort describing words or words that are attributed to that into each category. Just jumping ahead. Which of these words could be described as tranquil? Notice here I've got trachius, which starts the same as tra, and then I've got quill, which is like tranquil to have those phon they're called phonological distractors because they sound similar when they're distracting your mind thinking oh is that tranquil but they're trying to put you off some people would say this is a trick question dylan william who's a great educational researcher says that's a brilliant question because you're really honing into the fine detail that's metacognitively thinking right which one's right here it's a lot harder task and then select the correct word for setting so again, a house where an event takes place, similar. The main events, no. The first scene, no. Place or type of surroundings, no. Forest, no. Well, that is a setting, but it doesn't describe the word setting. And then, and then there's one more. The school something was a jail, and the answer would be premises. Okay, so I'm just going to move on. So finally to show you these roots here. I haven't got to a 10 past. Is that right? Yeah. I think yeah. it is. Yes. yes. So just showing you this, this is one example of what we've used in tutor time. And I'll show you a one minute clip of that tutor time.
going on now, and that will be from an RS teacher, so she's not a literacy specialist, but you can see how other, other teachers can make use of it. And then I'd give them some examples, and then talk them through what those words mean. So I'll just show you that example. Tutors are also given these, so they're broken down into the meanings of words, so that it's not up to the tutors to be kind of frantically rushing around trying to find meaning. Uh, you might not be able to hear this. Geo, writing down as many words as they can related to geo. The girls were swimming. This isn't the boys' school. <laughs> and then you hear these conversations here. These boys talk about. Geode being a rock. Okay. Okay. And then after that, after they've generated that, they'll feedback what they think that root means. So they're not told what it means. Okay. What's going to be that? Well, yeah. Well,